Welcome to the HR Champions podcast with me, Phil Scott of HR Recruit, uh, where I bring you HR leaders who've given up their time to share with you their experiences within human resources past and present. Today, I'm delighted to introduce Glenn Jones, people consultant and author of book titled Human Resources Change the World. Uh, Glenn will be discussing his career to date, uh, how he left school with one O level and he's worked his way up to within HR is now undertaking a doctorate as well. So that introduction does it no justice whatsoever. So I'm gonna hand over to Glenn if you'd like to uh, just give the uh, listeners a bit of an overview of yourself and your background. Yeah, of course, thanks Phil. So where do I start, gosh. Um, so for the last eight and a half years, I have been a freelance HR consultant uh, working for some FTSE uh, 100 companies around the world, such as Tesco, Ecolab, Imperial Brands, HSBC, and a few others to, to name those. Uh, the roles that I've been sort of doing have been varied, but a lot in HR transformation and recovery, uh, uh, badly transformed programs of work that have gone, gone awry, but also looking at shared service functions, outsourcing, insourcing, and big sort of programs of work you know, like Tesco, where they were uh, moving over to Oracle HCM Cloud. I am a chapter fellow of both the CIPP and the CIPD. As Phil mentioned, I wrote a book in 2018, which was titled Human Resources Change the World, which I know we'll talk about briefly on this call. And currently, as Phil said, I'm also uh, undertaking a doctorate, uh, which I started back in March at the University of Derby. And that's me, Phil. Thanks, Glenn. Um, so, what my first question that uh, perked up my interest. You left school with one O level. What what was the one O level? <laughs> uh, thankfully it was commerce, uh, so business studies as they call it today. Um, and, and the commerce that I had, the qualification I had was at C grade. Of course now C grade is, is just part of the grading structure. I did have others but C was the best mark that I could attain. There are numerous reasons for it. Um, I won't go into it, it's highly personal, but to say that I hated school was an understatement and uh, I just couldn't wait to get out. So I left when I was 16 with just that one level in commerce. Thanks, Glenn. And uh, well, how did you get into HR then? It's, it's a really strange story in so much that uh, initially I was planning to go to um, the music academy in, in the army, Nella Hall. Uh, because I also played clarinet and a few other instruments and my family's musical going back generations. So I was initially going through uh, the RAF uh, to become a, a bandsman and also the military police. But I actually failed in the, uh, the medical, uh, ironically, and therefore I, I started to look around at what was out there. The actual first um, role or job that I had was actually on a YTS scheme, a youth training scheme back in, in 1983. And um, that was actually reboring engines, would you believe? <laughs> so I was with 40 other guys on a shop floor, hands up to my elbows in, in Greece and um, in the cold re reconditioning engines. And it just so happened one day, uh, Peggy Darby, who was the manager, HR manager in the office, came out onto the shop floor and said, Glenn, she said, um, I can see you've got uh, O-level commerce, she said, how would you like to come and work in this nice office where it's warm, learn everything that there is about office and business management and HR and payroll and, and systems? And I thought about it for one nanosecond and went, okay, I'm going. Uh, <laughs> I joined nine 16 to 18 year old women in that office and I learned a lot uh, about life in general at that time. But I also got a lot of stick, ironically, from the boys that are left behind on the shop floor who weren't very happy about my moving movement into HR. So that's that's my story. Okay. And um, what what is it that you like about working within human resources? I think it, it's the interaction with people. I think when it comes down to everything that we do within HR, it's all about people. It's all about sort of getting companies strategically ready, getting the people in the right place at the right time getting the systems working as they should be working and that interaction with 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 people I, I think as a function is the best function there is to actually sort of have that interaction and have that 
real classical influence on the organization at heart. And I think the last six months in particular, whilst we've been going through Corona and continue, I suppose, for a little while longer, HR has been really pivotal, I think, in a lot of the good stuff that's been happening in the last six months. So that, in a summary, is, is what it's all about for me. It's all about people. Okay, now um, you're over the last few years been doing uh, interim assignments, interim work. Um, how did you get into to interim work initially? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, so for me, a lot of my CV, if you ever to look at my CV, the longest I've ever stayed somewhere really was at the BBC in the 90s for about four and a half years. Um, essentially, I guess I've always been operating as an interim. I've always been moving from a company to another company, picking up new skills, new ways of doing things, learning different technology, uh, being aware of globalization, etc. So in 2012, when I left Evershed as the head of HR for uh, international HR, I took the option of not jumping into the next permanent role that came along. I wanted to really sort of understand if I could work for myself, number one. Um, number two, uh, essentially, it was an opportunity for me to test how much I knew, uh, which was important to me, uh, because as a person, I continually develop in everything that I try to do. And also, it was about um, having the opportunity to work for some really great companies, but not be tied into a permanent long-term contract. So I was able to go in, do something really great, learn something and move on. I, so as a result of that, I'm now up to sector number 18, which has allowed me to pick up some really good understanding of how different companies around the world work. Uh, and that's why I chose the, the interim life. Okay, that uh, covers the, uh, the question I was going to ask in terms of the why, but um, what would you say the pros and cons then? Um, I know you said probably touched upon it, but um, what are the main pros and cons um, of working as an interim? So maybe for, for anyone that's considering uh, making that move, what would you say? Yeah, yeah I think the cons, I'll start with that if I may. Uh, the cons are really around um, the security of course uh, right now um, obviously people are cutting back on everything that's happening so the interim market is quite quiet so there's that to consider there's also the legislative changes that the government are making around ir35 which is making it in particularly difficult in the private sector public sector of course went through it a couple of years ago so they're more used to the ways of working now and, and what that ir35 means so they're the real cons to me. It's about job security or security in general uh, and around government legislation. The pros, though, I think, if you're really into thinking about this seriously, is that you get so much dynamic range, uh, not only different companies that you're working with, different cultures if you work globally. You get presented with different things that you necessarily wouldn't be presented to um, within the permanent market so and you get challenged because every day you walk into the office and you don't know what's going to come up so for me it, there's a big buzz around being a freelance intern uh, which you don't necessarily get as a permanent and I very much enjoy being challenged and, and learning and developing so uh, that would be my pros and cons list. Okay and how, how do you typically pick up interim assignments then? Yes, great question. So, so normally uh, it's the 80-20 rule, the Pareto rule. Normally what you find is 80% of your instructions come through your network. So if anybody's thinking out there of being an interim, a lot of the way you will actually get work is through word of mouth uh, and it very much depends on that. 20% of it will come through the traditional recruitment approach through agencies. Mm -hmm. So essentially LinkedIn and places like that are highly critical to an interim. Uh, that's why I spend a huge amount of time trying to grow my network with on LinkedIn as an example. So I think I'm up to about just over 16,000 connections worldwide now, which enables me to I suppose, share articles and let people know I'm available. Uh, and also people can see my profile and if something is coming up, they, they know I'm available or not. Thanks, Glenn. And um, is there a particular type of, of interim role that you specialise in? You know, what type of projects do, would you say you undertake? Yeah, it's ironic. I, 
got a bit of a label, um, which is quite sad, I suppose, in a way. It, it's more in the firefighting area. It's more in the recovery area now, where, for whatever reason, uh, companies around the world have got in trouble with whatever they're doing, whether it's a transformation, an outsourcing, an insourcing, um, a, a technology program, workforce productivity, HR shared services, etc. Um, so that's the range of my skill set and experience. So it tends to be, uh, on the whole at the moment, recovery of um, badly implemented programs or badly implemented uh, pieces of work that are just stalled or not gone the way they should have done. Uh, I would love, to, of course, to be in the ground of starting something from the fresh so that I could actually do it right for a company. But at the moment, it seems to be it's more in the vein of, you know, we've got a problem in blank, can you come and help us sort it out, uh, coach and mentor teams, and put things back on the right path, which is what I love to do uh, to enable then the the people who are in those companies to take it on thereafter. Uh, I'm not the sort of person who goes into a company as an example and withholds all of the information. As, as I mentioned earlier on, I, I get a great buzz of helping people develop and, and coach people wherever I can. Uh, so for me, they're the sort of areas where I tend to get pulled into these days. Um, hopefully that answers your question yes thank uh, it does and and uh, we discussed um previously i think you've, you've done quite a bit of uh sort of studies a, a, as well on um business transformation projects and, uh, and and why they fail just talk to me a little bit about that yeah it's really interesting because uh hr in particular from a transformation perspective has you know, the real opportunity to do things really well. And I think um, where most programs tend to fall down traditionally is very, it's at the outset actually, it's at the beginning of what it is that's going to happen and how it's going to happen. So if it's a technology change, for instance, what does that look like? What's the return on the investment for it? So very much at the beginning, it's, it's been very clear about the business case of what it is. Number two, I think it's about the support and the continued support of the stakeholders within those transformation programs, really critical to the success of it. Um, and lastly, if you're contracting out to a third party, so you're looking to get some help from someone else, whether that be actual professional services, whether that be a service itself of, of something, whether that be a product, it's around the contracting of whatever that is. And I think that those three are super critical really to the success of any transformation program, whether it's in HR or not. It, you have to make sure that everybody's crystal clear at the start of what it is that you're trying to achieve, how you're gonna achieve it, and what support and continued support that that program absolutely needs as it goes through its journey. Thank you. And um, I wanna bring it on to, to the book. I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions. Uh, you decide which one you answer first, but why did you decide to, to write a book and tell us a little bit about uh, what the book is about? Yeah, okay, so, uh, so the book itself, uh, I started looking at it actually in 2014 when I wanted to do a, a PhD about this, this troubling thing that was niggling away for me for many years, Phil. And I wanted to understand the basic question of why, if people are so important to every company around the world, why is it, as an example, that HR directors don't become CEOs? That, that was the basic premise. But also what I wanted to understand then was what were the blockers? What, what's the blueprint to becoming a CEO? What are the behaviors that are required? And, and what is the, the view of the, the mindset of HR in general? Is it growth or fixed? So um, the book is all about that. So essentially, when it came down to, to writing it, uh, in 2014, I wanted to do a PhD. I applied to University of Derby because I wanted to do it properly. But at the time, I was so busy with everything else that was going on. I just didn't have the time and the energy really to write 10,000 words to get me past that. So I then went through the next sort of three years thinking about oh, when am I going to do this? Because I couldn't see anything changing. I couldn't see anything moving forward really in the direction of, and I am generalizing, in the direction of travel that I wanted it to see go. So I happened to be in Amsterdam airport one day talking to a, a colleague from Accenture and he just turned around and said, well, why didn't you write the book, Glenn? 
So at least that will give you a starter for 10. It'll get it out on paper. It'll articulate what you think. And then who knows what would happen from there. And that's what I did. It literally took me six months to write the book. Uh, it took me three months to go through the editing process, which was a bit strange and a bit painful as well, especially when you're passionate about something. Somebody telling you, no, that's not going to work with that right. Uh, or the color of the, the book doesn't look that right. It was, it was an interesting process. But actually the book has just gone through its second anniversary now um, a few days ago, and it's still doing okay. It, it is a critical book uh, at the end of the day where HR was and continues to be generally. Um, but you know, I think if you're passionate about something, you have to write it and you have to get it out there. And it is noticeable that more and more people are starting to ask the question now about why HR directors don't become CEOs. Thanks, Glenn. And uh, I did a, a search earlier uh, and, and found uh, it's available on Amazon, either paper, uh, paperback. I think there is an audio book and, and also the Kindle version. It is, absolutely. And all proceeds for it um, are still going to Parkinson's. My father, unfortunately, passed away uh, just over a year ago. And um, ever since, uh, the book proceeds have been going there. So I, I personally don't get any money from it. I never wrote it to get you know become a millionaire that was never the never the plan it was more about you know i need something to happen and i think that's the best way to do it sometimes is to get your thoughts out there and spark the debate good um yep yeah, so anyone that wants to to download that as i say uh you know we really make sure you look on amazon i'm not on commission because uh, like glenn said it's uh, all proceeds go to to charity um so I mean, the, the, the HR Champions podcast is all, all about HR leaders. Uh, and when you become a leader, you sort of, uh, you, you end up being top of the tree. So uh, you've got to really draw upon your own experiences. There's no one sort of generally above you, leading you, mentoring you. So I think you tend to have to take inspiration from people that have stood out in your career. What, who have you learned from in your career? Who, who, who who stands out for you? Who you who who have you learned from? Do you know what uh, uh, person that I work with? Um, and this probably tells you a bit about who I am as a person. Everybody that I work with, I've always taken something away from. And I think in life you have to do that. You you, you listen to people and you take what resonates with you or or where you need to develop, and then you 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 move the rest to the left. So th there's been so many people through the course of my career ever since that first person who spoke to me on the shop floor back in when I was 16, um, she, she saw something in me um, that enabled me to actually do something with my life, um, which would have been a different direction, no doubt. And I think then pretty much everybody that I've talked to worked with has given me something. There was a great piece of advice that I remember. So um, when I was working for Hoover in, in the late eighties, uh, where at 20 years old, I did my first system implementation, uh, HR payroll system implementation. I remember the guy there, he, the manager of both HR and finance at the time, turned around and said, what are you going to do, Glenn, about your studies? Um, you'll go a long way with experience, as an example, but you'll need to uh, uh, support that with qualifications. And um, as we know, at the start of this, I left school with one O level. Um, Two years after leaving school at 18, I did a uh, higher national certificate, so almost a two A levels in business management. I then, in the 90s, went and did my qualifications with the um, CIPP. Uh, in 2003 and six, I did my masters. Uh, I then became accredited with both CIPD and CIPP. And that piece of advice, Phil, stuck with me all the way through, which has got me to where I am today. And I guess. The doctorate is just another extension of all of that. It's supplementing the experience and knowledge and skills that I've picked up along the way to really sort of keep going. And there is something driving me. I don't know if it was the words that Ron gave me back in 1987 when he said about this or whether I already had it. It's just that I had a bad time in school, didn't like it and needed to move on. So, so for me to answer the question succinctly, Everybody at some stage, whether it be a manager or a line manager or, or someone I've worked with, they've given me the inspiration to continue to develop as a person. Um, I'm a great believer in 360 feedback as well. Uh, and not from a point of view of giving it lip service, but from a point of view of actually taking that feedback and doing something with it. So hopefully 
that gives you a sense for of who's inspired me through my career. And to, to continue learning, then, um, is you know, is, who do you learn from? Or is that the reason for the for the doctorate? It is very much from it, uh, you know. And what I've uncovered is another sort of spectrum of knowledge in the academic world, where you know people have been writing articles and journals on on all sorts of things, stretching back years and years and years. And it's an untapped piece of resource, which which business generally doesn't dovetail into. And I think that's why the doctorate that I'm doing is a good one because it it merges the academic stuff with the, um, the actual business world. So hence I'm doing a doctorate of business administration and not a PhD. So I think um, the people that inspire me today though are still the people that I connect with who, um, who are calculated risk takers, who are willing to stick their head up above the parapet and challenge the norm. And especially I think in HR, one of the things I'd love to see generally is for us to actually sort of break the mold, break the, the ethos of where HR is today and really elevate it even more than where it needs to be because it stands there as an absolute must have functional uh, piece. It, it, it's there for a reason. It's there to operate strategically and operationally. Um, so again, who inspires me? Pretty much anybody that fits into that mold of, of willing to really take that, that growth mindset challenge of, of pushing the boundaries and, and making things different for the for the sake and the benefit of everybody else. Thanks, Glenn. And um, I mean, your career, you've had, you know, a pretty strong uh, career to say the least. Um, certainly um, moving from one O level to, you know, to, to writing a book um, and, uh, and take it, you know, you've worked for some really, really strong brands, you know, world famous uh, businesses. Has it always gone swimmingly? You know, have you have you had any setbacks in your, your career? And if so, how, how have you overcome them? Uh, great, great question. I really thought about this one long and hard, actually. Um, the simple answer is yes, they have been setbacks, but I've never let them really be setbacks. So again, you'll probably gather my, my mindset is very much in the growth area. If I was to do Carol Dweck's growth versus fixed mindset, I would believe that I'm on the right there in, in the growth. So, so even though I've had setbacks, essentially for me, it's always been about, so what can I learn from them? How can I make it better so that next time around, if I make a mistake, you know, how can I apply that so I don't make the mistake again? And that's whether it's a technology program, whether it's implementing HR from scratch outside of the UK internationally, whether it's cult cultural uh, diversity, et cetera, et cetera. But I've always had the, the one quote that stuck with me, which is, if you make a mistake, admit it, learn from it, and please don't repeat it. So that's always stuck with me as a quote and a bit of a mantra, I suppose, in so much that, yes, you'll always get setbacks. And ironically, you're not always responsible for what happens to you uh, as a person. But I think you are responsible for how you react to that and how you learn from it accordingly. So, so that's my philosophy uh it stood me in good stead and uh it kept me positive through through my career so far are there any any well a question to you you know is there is there any mistakes that you've made that you'd um that you be that you could turn the clock back or is there any advice you could give to someone so they don't make the same mistakes yeah, it's probably a couple of, uh, one would be I, my family and I emigrated to New Zealand uh, back in 2006 and my daughter was actually born there. So she's lucky she has dual nationality. And um, we actually uh, came back in 2007, funny enough, I, I got a, an offer of a role with Accenture at the time, uh, which was again rescuing a, a Caribbean, funny enough, from their outsourcing of HR. And I think um, that was a pivotal point, a bit of a, an area where I thought, actually, could we have stayed in New Zealand and made a life of it? So personally, so this is a bit of personal insight into my life. Or should we have come back to the UK? Now, ironically, coming back to the UK and working with Accenture has really kept my career going. But I always think about, actually, what would have happened if I'd stayed in New Zealand, as an example, and um, really pushed on from there. So that's kind of like one area of setback that I think you always really have a look at life, life changing events like that and just saying, actually, is it the right thing? Even though at the time it felt like the right thing, I often wonder 
whether actually staying in New Zealand and making a career down there would have worked even better. That's another story altogether. Uh, I'm trying to think of another one for you, Phil. Uh, more in the technology space. Uh, uh, once upon a time in the early 2000s, I was working for Northgate Arinzo, who were uh, a company called Peterborough Software at the time, uh, where I was a senior HR payroll consultant implementing uh, Midland Software. Um, and, and that, sorry, Peterborough Software. And uh, essentially, one day I went in and I was essentially moving the system onto something else. And I forgot to take a backup of the system. And uh, it all went horribly wrong, uh, but fortunately I managed to find a backup somewhere else. So, um, but this is also, I think, something else when you're working on documents, especially in the HR space and the policy space, always make sure you, make sure you back up stuff because you don't want to lose it. Um, especially so if you're ever writing a book, it's not something you want to make a mistake of if you're going to lose anything at all. So a couple of things there really, but always apply yourself really, I think from a point of view, if something does happen to you, uh, try and take the best out of it and move on. Thank you, uh, thank you, Glenn. And uh, if anyone would um, wants wants to get in touch, if anyone's listening to the to a recording of this and they want to get in touch, um, what's the best uh, way for someone just to get in touch if they've got any queries or questions? Yeah, great. Uh, so two ways. Uh, either give me an email to Glenn. That's G L E W M at G G J H R dot com. So that's my short email address. Or link me on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm always welcome of anybody connecting up because I think the more we can share information, knowledge, and experience, the better. So those two avenues probably, Phil, would be the best place for, for you to go. And if you really want to give me a call, if you're that enthusiastic as well, my mobile number is 0775 Thank you, Glenn. And uh, that um, sort of concludes the recording part uh, of the podcast. Uh, a massive thank you to, to Glenn Jones uh, with regards to that. Uh, before we go into the uh, the live questions, I hope uh, the listeners have, uh, have enjoyed the podcast. Uh, please stay tuned for, for other recordings. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for, for, for listening. Mm-hmm.